Welcome to the second installment of the Critica Cultura Lecture Series. I'd like to call on uh, Ms. Mary Thomas from the Managing Editor of Critica Cultura to formally open our program today. In the absence of the indefatigable <laughs> Ms. Mary Thomas, let me welcome you to the second installment of Critica Cultura Lecture Series. Um, Crita Critica Cultura is an online journal of the English department, um, but aside from that, it is also committed to delivering um, here in the, in the Ateneo itself lectures by scholars working um, not only locally but also abroad. And this is the second, the first was just um, conducted last week. Um, it was Professor Enriquez de la Cruz's um, um, talk. Um, let, let me now call on Mr. Vince Serrano to introduce the speaker. Former students. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Rajiv Patil was born in India and educated in India in the UK, where he was a Rhodes Scholar in Oxford. He currently teaches at the National University of Singapore. He is the author of the long poems of Wallace Stevens, post-colonial poetry in English, several co-edited books on the literary cultures of Southeast Asia essays and articles on topics such as Irish poetry and the cultural criticism of Walter Benjamin. Forthcoming works include a co-authored history of Southeast Asian writing in English and the co-edited historical companion to the post-colonial literature, Continental Europe and its Empires. He is also working towards a future project on the relation of poetry to painting and he is a member of the International Board of Editors of critical culture. Friends, let's all welcome Reggie back. Thank you. Uh, I'm quite surprised so many of you after many hours of listening to uh, your teacher's lecture would want to come and listen to another stranger here uh, talk to you. But I hope I'll make it worth your while because I come as a kind of ambassador and it's quite nice that I should be born in India but an ambassador for Singapore because Singapore was an empty unpopulated island 200 years ago and it sort of had people come over from all parts of the world and as they love to call themselves there, they're at the center of a hub, a kind of spinning wheel and uh, it's a great place to be in. So I hope that I'll whet your appetite, your curiosity in some way with what I'm going to say today. Uh, I don't know what your stamina is, but I gather from which that he's been lecturing for three hours and now he's going to into his fourth hour. So if you are anywhere along the same lines, you are marathon runners for listening. Uh, which is more than I can say for myself. I've just come from a conference at UP. And I found after the morning two hours of lectures, I would start dozing off for every talk, however interesting, by however close a friend. And then found I could only wake up when the clapping sort of indicated <laughs> the talk was over. And I would compensate for the sleeping by asking the first question. <laughs> anyway, now, what can I tell you about Singapore, Malaysia? Firstly, in geographical terms, Malaysia and Singapore are part of one and the same peninsula. So in that sense, Singapore is a small island. Uh, it is incredibly small, and you who live in the Philippines, which is such a massive archipelago, densely populated, uh, won't appreciate how tiny Singapore is. If you get off at the airport, which is on the east side, I'm sorry, the west side of the island, it takes only 30 minutes to reach the other end on the west driving in a straight line from the airport to where I live. If you ever come there and we are friendly enough, I'll meet you at the airport and you will have crossed the entire island in half an hour. Now, that's the length. North to south, you can do in 25 minutes on a good day. Uh, the population is only a small fraction of a big city like Manila, 4 million. Of the 4 million, uh, you will not be surprised to know at least a million are expatriates and uh, foreign workers, including a lot of domestic and from uh, Philippines. Uh, they are, of course, the most prized members of uh, Singapore society because it is they who work the most hard and efficient and competently. 
Now, Singapore's gold reserves are among the biggest in the world per capita. So in that sense, it's an incredibly wealthy country, and it became a country very recently. Uh, Singapore and Malaysia are both part of a British Empire development. So, here's an outline of what I'm going to say. And unlike your teachers, I'm extremely bad at time management. So if I say I'm going to talk for one hour, unless something stops me, the principle of inertia continues strongly. <laughs> and I can keep on talking, sometimes even asleep. And therefore, I can't promise that I'll finish everything, but I'll about test your patience to whatever is the level of politeness in my host. And when I see restless faces, tired faces, and agitated organizers, I'll start winding down. Uh, the idea is there's a lot to say, and even as the bird flies very high, I can't pretend to be able to cover everything uh, in the, about one hour. Is that reasonable? Uh, I'll, I'll wait for signs of agitation and pain, then I'll use it. So I'm basically going to try and tell you about colonialism in a simple way, and I'm at each point going to try and keep some part of a comparison with what little I have discovered or know about the Philippines in mind, so that what I speak of about Singapore, Malaysia, has some point of contrast that you are more familiar with in the Philippines. Take the first simple fact we begin with. Singapore, Malaysia were colonized by the British. The Philippines were colonized later, later I'll tell you in what way, by the Americans. Later is not just a chronological thing. You have to remember that what we call or what the historians and political philosophers call imperialism, which is a slightly different connotation than colonialism, although the two concepts are, as you know, very close and in fact partially overlap without quite being synonymous. Now, imperialism of the Western kind started in the, what, well, started with Columbus in the 15th century. One of the most magnificent books I've ever read is by a geographer. It's an American called, he's an American called Alfred Crosby, and the book is called Ecological Imperialism. Why I mention it is because there he makes a very significant broad point. World civilizations have been, he says,